I know what you're thinking. I finally make the decision to visit Beach Church and the sermon's on video. Look, I understand, but you are right where you need to be. And right now, so am I. My mom's health has rapidly deteriorated. She has dementia and she's having some difficulty swallowing. And in fact, now she's not even able to get out of her own bed. So she's bound to her bed and uh, we, her children, made the decision to gather yesterday, Saturday, for one final time together as a family. So I invite you to just pray for us and pray for our family during this difficult season. Now, throughout this series in Philippians, I've repeatedly said that this letter's context matters greatly. Paul was not sitting back writing this letter in a study. He was not sitting down at sunrise, watching happy little birds sing on branches of olive trees while he sipped coffee and smelled bacon on the stove. Paul was under house arrest. He was chained up, locked down. His freedom was restricted. He had Roman guards standing over him, telling him when to wake up and when to go to sleep. Paul was in a miserable place, but instead of allowing his thoughts to travel down that road of despair, he demonstrated control over his thought life. He could have complained, he could have moaned and groaned about how life was not fair, and he could have written to the Philippians that, hey, guess what? God must not really love me because of all the bad stuff I'm going through. Instead of moaning and groaning, Paul wrote this. Philippians 8, 9 and 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me and everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Outside of all the passages explaining how to be forgiven for your sin and experience new life in Jesus, this is the one passage I believe followers of Jesus should memorize. And if you're a follower of Jesus, and by that I mean not attending church, I mean, you've surrendered your life to God by trusting in Jesus as the only way to be forgiven for your sins. You believe by faith that Jesus paid the price for your sin, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, and that one day he will return. And you've surrendered your life to him and you've committed to following him. If you have made that commitment to him, then from now until you meet Jesus face to face, you are in the process of becoming more and more like Jesus every single day. Church people call that sanctification. That's what we are called to do as followers of Jesus is to become more like him. And the key to becoming more like Jesus is to follow the instructions that Paul leaves us in Philippians 4, verse 8. It involves using our brain. Now, I know I'm not there, but I'm watching. So help me out by raising your hand. If you have a brain, raise your hand. Thank you. Now, if you were surprised that the person in front of you raised their hand, raise your hand. <laughs> Studies tell us that our brains produce up to 50,000 thoughts every single day. That's a lot of power that our brain has. And roughly 75% of those 50,000 thoughts are negative thoughts. That means 37,500 thoughts that we think every day are negative. We let our big, powerful brain wander 
and too often it settles on the negative. We think about what's wrong at work. We think about what's wrong with our families. We think about the ways everybody's disappointed us. We think about what's wrong with our health. We allow our brain to go out of control to wander into depressing negative thoughts rather than telling our brain to think what we want it to think. But the Bible teaches us that our outlook on life can be changed. Paul had every single reason in the world to have negative thoughts. His life wasn't easy. This man had been beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, thrown into prison countless times. Listen to the hardships he experienced. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole day and night adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, on the seas, and I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, and I've often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Paul had every reason to be negative and bitter and frustrated with life. He had every reason not to trust people. He had every reason to be skeptical, uh, skeptical about others, and he had every reason to question the motives of other people. He could have easily let his mind wander and think, life's not fair. Why is this happening to me? And maybe he could have even thought, God set Peter free from prison. He must not love me as much as he loved Peter. But Paul didn't go down that road. Instead, he locked his mind and wrapped his mind around what was true and what was praiseworthy. He knew something that we sometimes forget. Our thoughts don't have to be controlled by our circumstances. He didn't pretend everything was fine, but he controlled his mind and he focused on what God was doing, not on what Paul was feeling. So how do we overcome 37,000 negative thoughts every single day? Well, it's simple. We take control because positive thoughts are better than negative thoughts. Simple, right? Positive thoughts are better than negative thoughts. You and I have the ability to reject negativity and think positively. We have negative thoughts all the time about people at work, about our jobs, about our families, about our spouse, about our neighbors, about our future and our health, about one another, uh, about the utility company, about our finances. Negative thoughts about others weigh us with suspicion and doubts and anger. Negative thoughts about ourselves weigh us down with poor self-image and depression. But thinking positively can make such a difference in our lives. I think that's why Paul challenged these early followers of Jesus to think about positive things. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Paul's message is simple. You can control your thought life. You can control your thought life. Look, if you want to change your life, it starts with changing the way you think. Before changing our lives, we must realize that real change begins 
in our brain. It begins in our mind. If you want to break a bad habit, if you want to quit smoking, it starts in your mind. You, you have to tell yourself that you want to quit smoking. If you want to change the way that you speak to your children, that change begins in your mind. You have to set your mind on what is good and see yourself quitting smoking and see yourself speaking positively to your family. Our thought life is the foundation of everything that we do. In fact, everything we do and say is a result of our thoughts. You being here today is a result of your thought. At some point, you thought and said, I'm going to go to church this weekend. So you got up and you came to church because first you had that thought. And if you want to change addictions, loneliness, anxiety, fear, criticism, negativity, if you want to change the way that you communicate, if you want to change your relationships, fix your mind on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely. Rather than thinking bad thoughts about your family, your coworkers, your relationships, your children, your future, start thinking positive thoughts. Rather than living with fear, live positively, filled with hope. Now, let me throw out this disclaimer. If a, if a doctor has diagnosed you with depression or anxiety and has prescribed meds, please keep following the advice of your doctor. Stay on your medication but also don't be dependent on the medication. You've got to do the hard work too, and you've got to control your brain and tell your brain to think positively. And I know there's always the negative Nancy and the Debbie Downer. They try to defend their negative opinions about other people, and they say things like, well, I'm just trying to be honest. I'm just trying to be realistic. They say something bad about the person and then they say, bless their heart. Raise your hand if you've heard somebody do that before. They say something negative and then they say, bless their heart. Welcome to the South. But here's the problem with that line of thinking. Our opinion about other people can be wrong. Our opinions can't be trusted. We're told in Proverbs chapter three, verse five, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't depend on your own understanding. My understanding about other people can be way off. Your understanding about other people can be way off. We like to think that we've got it all figured out, but how often are we wrong? Let me give you an example about one day when my wandering random thought got me into trouble. One day I used my brain and I thought, my car needs an oil change. So I take my car to where I always take it. They scanned the code, looked me in the eye and told me I had never been there before. They kind of suggested that I was wrong about having been there before. So in my pride, I said, well, I'll just change the oil myself. Trust me, that was a bad thought that led to a bad decision. I drove to O'Reilly's, I bought five quarts of oil, an oil filter, an oil filter wrench. And even though it'd been 25 years since I last changed my own oil, I would do it to prove to myself that I could still do it. I don't need some oil change place to do it for me. So I put the car in the garage. The front end is lifted up on jack stands inside the garage of my house. I lay underneath the car and I kind of looked at the tires and immediately thought of a friend's dad who had died when he was changing the oil in his car because the jack stands fell. 
The car fell on him and crushed him. So what did I do? I climbed back out of the car, uh, out from underneath the car. I shook the jack stands to make sure they were sturdy, shook the car a few times, then crawled back underneath the car, scooted back on my back, still looking at the jacks. Then Christy came into the garage and the very first thing she said when she saw what I was doing was, don't forget about that man who died that we knew the man who died changing his oil. So I thanked Christy for the encouragement. I turned that oil pan bolt loose and the oil flowed down over my arms, my hands, into my face, my hair. For the next two days, my coffee tasted like oil. Why? Because one prideful, stubborn thought, I was right, led to a poor decision. God does not want you and I to depend on our own understanding because we are limited in our own understanding. Like we talked about last Sunday, we don't see the big picture like God does. Our assumptions, our suspicions, our conclusions are often wrong. But when we gain control of our thoughts and we begin to think about what is good, right, pure, excellent, and worthy of praise, we will discover that godly thinking leads to godly living and God's presence. Godly thinking leads to godly living and God's presence. Now check out verse nine. After Paul told these believers to control their thought lives and think about what is good, then he began to point to himself as an example that they could follow. He said, keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Now, Paul was pointing at his own life, the way he lived. Look, these, these Philippian believers, they had Paul up on a pedestal. They admired Paul. They respected Paul. They valued his wisdom and understanding. And the reason why they did is because Paul allowed the Spirit of God to direct his thought life because godly thinking leads to godly living. If you want to experience the presence of God in your relationships, if you want to have a better attitude toward those around you, begin to live godly. Begin to get into God's presence on a regular basis. It's so important for us as followers of Jesus to read the Bible daily and talk to Jesus. The more time we spend with him, the more we become like him. Godly living only happens when we have godly thoughts about how we want to live. So what do we do with those negative thoughts? What do we do when those thoughts creep into our lives when they just saturate us? 37,000 negative thoughts every single day come crashing down around us. How do we prevent those thoughts from causing our lives to careen out of control. Well, when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he, he addressed thoughts that kept people from experiencing a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Now, in this passage, he's talking about evangelism. And he's talking about uh, how he would uh, talk to people and listen to them and then take the thoughts that they had that were wrong and lead them to Jesus. He said this in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. He said, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Paul was talking about the rebellious thoughts of other people. These rebellious thoughts were keeping others from coming to know Christ as Savior. And so what Paul did is he captured their thoughts and he taught them to obey Christ. So what do we do with the thoughts that pull us down and keep us from experiencing God's peace 
and God's promise of peace? First, we acknowledge them and then we capture them. We acknowledge those thoughts are negative and then we grab a hold of them and we ask God to help us replace those negative thoughts with his truth. Now, Paul's life wasn't easy. He had every reason to focus on the negative, but instead he fixed his mind on what was true, honorable, and worthy of praise. He captured those negative thoughts and he taught them to obey Christ. And you and I can do the same. The key to real change in our lives begins with our thought life. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're tired of the same negative patterns playing repeatedly in your mind. You're tired of the same negative patterns in relationships and at work. Maybe you're ready for a change in your habits and your relationships and maybe you're ready for a change in how you see yourself. Well, I've got a solution for you. Today, as you leave, you have an opportunity to get plugged into a sermon-based life group. People will come along beside you and they will do life with you. Instead of you stewing in your 37,000 negative thoughts every day, you can join a group of people who will surround you, who will encourage you, who will pray for you, who will speak words of life to you. And the great thing is, you'll be able to do the very same thing for them. Once a week, you get to sit around in a small group, talk about the sermon, how you can apply it to your life. Imagine if life groups had already started and you could talk to others about keeping positive and ask them to pray for you. You could talk about the sermon today with a group of other people. Wouldn't that be awesome? So after the closing worship song, I want you to run and get signed up. We only have openings in 19 groups. So shove people out of the way, knock them down and run to the front of the line. Don't do that. But I want you to know we've got groups for singles, for young families, empty nesters and super seniors. Consider signing up today. Consider investing in yourself and in your thought life. Now, this is your last chance to sign up for a life group until January, so get signed up. Now, I'm closing. And when negative thoughts creep in, don't ignore them. Don't ignore them. Capture them. Stop what you're doing. Ask God to help you replace them with his truth. Find one thing, just one truth that you can praise God for in that moment. And as you keep doing this, watch how God transforms your heart, your mind, and your life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for Philippians 4, 8. We thank you for this challenge that you've given to us today. And Father, it's our prayer that you would take control of our thought life. Thank you for your word that says not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Help our behaviors and help our thoughts be conformed to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.